Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Introducing Lava Light Cactus Grow Plus, the green one. Cactus Grow Plus can help to create the perfect environment for your cacti and succulents to thrive, promoting healthy root systems and providing excellent drainage through its moisture retention. Cactus Grow Plus can be used as part of a cactus potting mix or cactus potting soil or on its own as a complete cactus potting media. Look out for it online and in your local gardening stores. Find out more at lava-light.co.uk. So Tom Massey, where do we begin? House and Garden Top 50 Garden Designer, RHS Gold Medal and BBC People's Choice winner, TV presenter, author of The Resilient Garden and Snappy Dresser. Welcome to the podcast, Tom. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. <laughs> Welcome oh, to the podcast. I love the snappy dresser on the end. I had to add that. He really in. is. And he's got the best beard stash of the local area. <laughs> I, can never, I can never pull it off. Got the wrong shape face. The local area. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here and spending time with us today. We really want to delve into, you know, you, your background, your career, what it takes to be a garden designer, some of the work that you've done in the past. So it would be amazing if we could go back to the beginning, really, and kind of find out a bit uh, maybe about your early years. Did you always know you wanted to be a garden designer? How did that happen? Um, Yeah, I I suppose going really far back when I was a kid. we had a small i grew up in richmond and we had a small sort of london townhouse type garden you know kind of uh brick walls uh small beds a small area of grass and a little more kind of wild bit at the back and um i I think i I always love spending time out in the garden my mum was a really keen gardener or is a really keen gardener Mm -hmm. so um she would let me have a little patch of the garden that i could call my own and i remember going to the garden center and picking out plants and just, you know, random selection of things that I like the look of and just putting them in the ground and then watching them grow. And that experience of seeing something, you know, grow from a, you know, a tiny seedling into a fully fledged plant was, was always really exciting to me. Um, and alongside that, we had a small allotment nearby. So we'd often go up there and, you know, grow things like beans or potatoes or um, things that you could eat. And, and I always found that also really exciting that you could grow something and eat it. Uh, and, you know, you'd get that kind of very fresh uh, taste and the satisfaction of knowing all the effort that you put in and had paid off. So I think that that was my first sort of experience. That was probably, you know, when I was like four plus, you know, really early experience of gardening. Um, but I, I suppose in, in, in to the second part of the question, I didn't always know that I wanted to be a garden designer. I, I, you know, I love the outdoors. I find natural landscapes very inspiring. I spend lots of time, um, you know, exploring, um, in, in, in more recent years, the British Isles, I spent time in the Highlands, you know, a lot of time down in Scotland yeah. and sort of in between, everywhere in between, just exploring, um, exploring the landscape. So I think landscapes have a really big effect on me uh, and, and it's something that I am very inspired by um but when I was um when I was younger I also was uh interested sorry I'll just cut and just turn my emails off because I'm just gonna think <laughs> I had to text my husband and say please do not FaceTime <laughs> me <laughs> yeah sure. sorry I'll carry on that. So when I were I, w- I was also really interested in um, drawing and art. So I did an art foundation course, which is an opportunity basically to try lots of different things. So it was at London College of Communication. So it focused on film, photography, animation, uh, kind of moving image based or image based um, production. 
And I found animation really inspiring, actually. I, I love the um, the ability to create worlds and to uh, design characters and then to animate them and to tell stories. So that led me on to do a BA Honours degree in animation production at the Arts Institute yeah. Bournemouth, which is now the Arts University Bournemouth. Um, so that that was a really interesting course to do because it, it you know it ranged from computer animation to um, model making and stop motion, uh, lots of observational and life drawing. So it was a really good um, grounding in in a lot of the principles that, and you know a lot of the techniques that I use now in my in my garden design career. Mm -hmm. um, so when I finished that course, I then went and spent some time um, kind of working freelance in advertising, uh, you know, animating for uh, for small agencies around London. And I, I enjoyed it to some degree, but I found it was way too much sitting in a dark room, you know, working on my own, producing um, quite interesting pieces of work, but all quite commercial. So I, I kind of fell out of love with that quite quickly and realised that I wanted to do something much more tangible, um, you know, that was still creative but had more of a physical element to it. Mm -hmm. So that's what led me to to think about retraining um, as a garden designer. So I I kind of thought that, you know, I I'd, I'd, I'd thought uh, as well as doing the the that stuff, I was doing lots of other things. Like I'd taken a lease on a warehouse space in Hackney and we converted it into a co-working space in a cafe. Uh, I was putting on events and, and parties. So I was doing so many different things um, and didn't really have one thing that I felt was a career that was going to be viable long term. So that, yeah, at, at 28, that led me to think, you know, I, I needed to find a career that would be long term, that would be something I could really immerse myself in and, and be really engaged with. So that was what led me back to, uh, well, well, to garden design as a career. I forgot to mention, actually, when I was 16, I worked for six months with a landscape gardener. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd, I'd sort of had a taste. I dropped out of college because I was doing courses that, uh, or A-levels I really didn't like. I was doing IT and PE and, and very academic subjects. So I, I left one college, uh, spent a year, sort of half the year traveling, the other half working with this, this landscape gardener. And then um, went back to college doing more kind of creative subjects like photography and uh, architectural design. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd had a, I'd had a bit of a a bit of a taste as uh, you know as to what a, a career in garden design might look like when I was sixteen. So that that had also stuck with me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I went I went to London College of Garden Design, uh, trained there with Andrew Wilson um, and his team. And really just immediately uh fell in love with it really as a you know as a as a process and as um as a potential career and, and what i found um really helpful was that animation training so all the software i mm -hmm. took to really quickly you know it was um i found it really easy to learn the software because i've been using kind of more advanced software uh, doing animation work and the all the observational and life drawing that I'd I'd been doing, uh, you know, was was also very helpful. Um, so it, yeah, it was interesting coming at it from a kind of roundabout way. But I think everything that I had done, you know, and, and putting on events and running this co working space were, were really good business experience. Mm -hmm. um, so coming into garden design from with with this sort of mixed background. Uh, actually, I think stood me in really good stead to to change career and move into into what I do now. Mm -hmm. And of course, the program that a lot of people know you for, your garden made perfect, is, uses that virtual element, which is obviously that kind of linked back a lot to your animation experience. I guess so it was nice when it then went in that direction. This program, I guess, but we will we will touch on the program a little bit more shortly. But that must have been a cool link up, right? Yeah, I mean, that really is what drew me, you know, I didn't really have any desire to be on a TV program. Um, no. But the, the the kind of offer came in at the, the back end of COVID. Uh, so work had dried up a bit. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of virtual reality aspect I found really interesting and was quite excited mm -hmm. by. So I think that, that those were the, you know, one work was a bit quiet too. There was that virtual aspect. That's what drew me to be quite um, interested in it you know and um drew me to to do that okay 
cool. I love that we, basically at the beginning, we asked you to tell us about yourself and you did for like about five minutes flat. You're like, you could interview yourself, Tom. You're really good at talking. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I just could have got a made of coffee. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I was going to say before that so many people who we interview come into horticulture one way or another through having a prior career and then bringing all of those skills into the role that they're doing in horticulture and really finding their feet you know kind of going through all these different kind of routes trying you know different careers but generally sort of within that same um kind of kind of like you you liked animation and art you know and you're tra- translating that into your garden design now so many people kind of make that process in one way or another in horticulture and then really find their feet in um gardening one way or another which is so wonderful to hear because then horticulture as an industry gains all the skills <laughs> you know from all of the all of that training that people have done prior to coming into into that industry and um in the introduction michael had said that you you know you wear so many different hats you've done so many different things within um since you've come into you know being a landscape designer which of all of those things do you prefer the most so tell us about some of them and which ones you love the most i'm i'm saying it's probably i'm going to guess it's probably not tv presenter after what you just said i don't know, <laughs> I, don't know. No, I mean that i'm being slightly unfair to the tv aspect i think what the point i was making is i hadn't really come into this career to be a tv gardener you know that wasn't my goal it was much more to be able to work with plants to make physical tangible uh you know gardens and to use the the creativity and the um the kind of artistic skills that I built up to actually make real physical spaces that can have, you know, a, a really quite profound effect on people's lives. So that that's what I that's what drew me to it. All the things that have come along with it, like the TV presenting, you know, the opportunity to write a book, uh, doing things like this podcast with you guys, you know, show gardens, all of those. I had no idea when I was retraining that I'd be doing that. I, I imagined that I would be like the landscape gardener I was working with. And, and I, I call him a landscape gardener because that's what he called himself. You know, he wouldn't have referred to himself as a garden designer. He did do design work, but he he was much more a design and build. So he would design gardens kind of in quite, um, you, you know, he draws everything by hand. He'd do some really nice sketches and then he'd just, uh, you know, agree uh, a sum with the, with the client. It was quite a nice way of working. So I, I thought in my head when I was retraining, I'd be working kind of mainly in the local area, you know, getting work through Google adverts and 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 kind of going out, designing and then building people's gardens myself. That that's what I had in my mind when I was when I was retraining. And it's been quite a kind of well, quite an incredible journey, really, like what I've what I've actually ended up doing. I've so in 2018, um, as a as an opportunity to research for a Chelsea garden, I found myself being escorted by armed guard over uh, the Turkish border along the Syrian border into northern Kurdish Iraq to visit a refugee camp. And I, I literally, you know, when I was doing it, I was like, "What am I doing?" You know, I've I've, yeah. I've retrained as a garden designer to to design gardens, and now I'm visiting a you know a, a quite a, on quite a dangerous journey, um, being escorted by armed guard into a refugee camp to talk to refugee gardeners, uh, gardener to gardener, and to find out what why people are growing what they're growing and what you know how what it means to them to have this access to or you know this ability to garden and to be able to create gardens in this really harsh environment and it that was actually quite a kind of profound uh career changing moment for me i think you know out of all the the trips i've, I've traveled quite a lot just you know going to places like thailand or japan on on uh, on holiday essentially but this trip um was uh, you know a real uh, it, it sounds you know can sound cheesy but it was kind of a life-changing moment so it really enforced to me how important gardening can be and whether that's um you know to restore a sense of normality to to find peace to uh, improve your mental health to you know to grow food but people in the camp had it, it was incredible the stories i heard you know some people had um taken cuttings of their favorite plants or collected seeds and these are people that are fleeing for their lives, you know, to, to to think about that, to have the presence of mind to do that when you're literally fleeing your home, taking everything you've got and, and you're still thinking about your garden and, and what it is you grow and how important that is to you. 
So speaking to those people really enforced to me how gardening kind of transcends cultures, transcends um, experience in a way. And it is something that everyone, I think, you know, universally can relate to as something that's really important, this ability to grow and to nurture and to um, see things, uh, see things flourish in a way. Mm. So that, like taking a piece of their home with them kind of thing, like taking something that's precious to them from you know their home I yeah. do not you know I, I, I totally understand what you mean by having the presence of mind in order to do that when you're fleeing somewhere but um I've worked with some uh refugees and asylum seekers at a community garden and those bring those tiny little cuttings that they've taken or a small plant that they've put into their rucksack you know keeps them kind of grounded and gives them hope as well so it's you know it, it's amazing what plants can do for people isn't it yeah, I think it, it's, um, as I said, it, you know, that really kind of enforced to me how important gardening is. And and I think, you know, even in the time that I've been working in this industry for roughly 10 years now, I've, I've seen a change in focus and a change in, um, I suppose, kind of weight given to landscape designers. So I, I think earlier on in my career, you know, the landscape designer was the last person to be brought onto the team. It was always, you know, the landscape design was the last thing to be done once everything else had been designed. Often, you know, planning had already been secured and it was a sort of afterthought, you know, how, we, you know, we've forgotten about the garden, but we need to do something with it because it's been trashed because of the house, because of the house. Or, you know, with a the developer, they they do everything else, so everything else is prioritised and then the garden is, is sort of thought about last. But now I think that focus is shifting. And I'm finding that we're being brought in right at the outset and asked to collaborate much more holistically with the rest of the team. So with architects, with engineers. Um, so it feels like there's a shift and it feels like, you know, as landscape designers, as, as people working in the horticulture industry, we're kind of almost now on the front line of, um, of this sort of battle that we're all facing with the climate emergency, with the biodiversity crisis. So many things in the world are, are kind of intrinsically linked to our landscape and to our, our outdoor spaces that we, you know, we have this power and this ability to influence that and to change it. And I think it, you know, it feels like there's a, a real groundswell and a real, focus on on our industry which is uh, i think really welcomed because often it, it is shunted into the kind of you know the back of people's minds or the last thing that that is thought about mm-hmm. yeah totally so let's kind of delve into garden design a little bit can you remember the first garden that you designed and also what was the most special project maybe they're the same garden <laughs> Uh, the the very first garden, the the first actual garden I designed. So in the course, you do all these theoretical designs, um, and yeah. some of those, you know, I wish could have been built because they were really interesting briefs or mm. or spaces. But the the very first garden I designed was a small front garden for my aunt. Um, so you know, finishing the course, having no, um, you know, some some people on the course had lots of wealthy friends, so were off doing these amazing, so you know, huge projects straight out of college. I uh, had to kind of work my way up a bit more because, you know, it's, I, I was quite young at the, well, 29, I think, when I finished and didn't really have any portfolio. Um, mm. So I, I needed to, you know, try and design where I could really. So I asked my aunt if she'd let me design um, her front garden. So it was just a tiny little space uh, with a bin stall with a green roof, uh, you know, some planting um, and a bit of paving. So it, it's definitely not my finest creation, but it was a, a really good experience to, you know, from doing the course, designing these sort of, um, you know, really big scale, really ambitious projects to then being grounded into reality. You know, here's a real project. You have to work with a real contractor. You know, it's, it's real money that's being spent. It was a good experience to see that from, you know, from start to finish. Um and I, uh, alongside doing my own projects, so I, I kind of started off with a few small projects like that. They kind of progressively got bigger as you know as I got more in my portfolio. Um, but alongside that, I I thought that show gardens would be a good way to get my name out there. So mm-hmm. I applied to do a garden at Hampton Court. Uh, it's straight straight out of college. I just thought, right, I need to you know I need something to give me a portfolio piece and to start to promote my uh, you know my name as a garden designer so I, I applied to do a garden at Hampton Court with a, a friend from college called John Ward 
um and we got we got the garden in and we managed to get funding for it and that was um in 2016 a garden with the UN Refugee Agency, uh, UNHCR. That this this garden actually led on to the second garden that I, I talked about earlier, uh, where I went to visit a refugee camp. Um, but I use the the, the shows uh, and show gardens as a way to to sort of boost my portfolio and to get my name out there a bit a bit more, especially early in my career. I also um, worked part time two days a week with Andrew Wilson and Gavin McWilliam and um, McWilliam Studio. They were called then. So I, I kind of had a, a really good mix of working with them on on kind of big scale uh, or you know high budget projects uh, that had um, lots of intricate details, you know, big areas of planting. So I was sort of progressing my knowledge there, and then I was doing smaller projects of my own and show gardens mm-hmm. um, as a way to you know to to start to to get the ball rolling. Do you think that you have a, a kind of signature style to your designs? And if you do, is that kind of where your book came from? Are they linked? Um, I get asked that a lot, you know, what's your style? And I think I try to avoid a style as much as possible because I think styles are, uh, uh, you know, often I get asked what, what are the latest garden trends or what what trends are you following this year? Or And I find that question um quite difficult to answer because i suppose i'm trying not to work with trends i'm trying more to work with the site with the client with the brief you know to to make a garden that is relevant and feels uh of that place rather than is adhering to the style that i'm trying to enforce on it and i think the you know through writing the book um the the resilient garden all about resilience and, and how to build resilience into our garden spaces it, there's a whole chapter on site analysis and the importance of the site to uh, you know to understanding that site to really building and, and designing a resilient space so i i i, I don't think um and i don't know some people might disagree i don't think i would say that my gardens are um necessarily all that similar i think there's probably certain aspects that you could say you know maybe uh quite detailed hard landscaping alongside softer planting you know there, there's probably certain things that um you could pick out as uh traits or or kind of unifying elements through the designs but i wouldn't say that you would necessarily be able to put two of my gardens side by side and say that's definitely you know uh, a tom massey designed garden mm. that's cool uh, and obviously building a flower show is, that, uh, is such a big job, isn't it? We loved what you made at Hampton Court recently with the Edimental Garden. Just talk to us a little bit about the process of a build at a flower show and kind of how involved is the designer and the landscaper? Where do they kind of overlap? You obviously work in partnership. And what are the best and worst bits of it all as well? <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's bits it's of the bacon rolls, I know. Yeah, the bacon rolls and the coffee um the so the the process of building a show garden is like nothing else i mean once you have if you've ever been to the build of a hampton court or a chelsea flower show you know it's uh, particularly chelsea flower show it's absolutely insane like the the level of construction that's going on all around you know it's it's like a sensory overload walking onto the site you've got diesel fumes everywhere you've got so many people in high vis you've got loads of traffic you've got big machinery everywhere and you've got this kind of mad buzz of everyone having to get everything finished you know there's no slipping of program on all all projects like almost universally go over the the program you know that it is very unusual for a project to finish exactly when the the kind of allocated program uh is time to finish but at chelsea there are, and, and hampton court and any show garden there is none of that it can't slip beyond the deadline so because of that everyone is working you know city hours like 12 13 hour days are uh, kind of so focused and so um determined to get it done and there's this real kind of good camaraderie uh, between the teams and y- you kind of you know, as a designer, um, I know some designers are slightly different, but I just am there the whole time. You know, I think you can't really step away because it's so pressured, it's so tight. You've got typically between two and three weeks to build. 
Uh, you, you just need to commit yourself to be there the whole time and to mm-hmm. oversee it. And, and there's there's a lot of decisions that you kind of make on the fly as well that are, mm-hmm. uh, you know, something's not quite worked out. What are we going to do? Because there's not time to go back to the drawing board and redraw it and redesign it or refabricate. You've just got to decide what you're going to do on the spot and say, right, let's do that instead. That's going to work fine. So it's kind of... Um, yeah it, like the jeopardy involved it is pretty high uh and you know the the kind of share with the contractor the shared knowledge that you both have you know you have to work together and finish on time so there's a lot of um yeah a lot of coffee a lot of um <laughs> sleepless nights um a lot of real kind of hard pushes and you know if it's raining you can't stop you have to keep going if it's baking heat you can't stop you have to keep going so it's kind of it ends up being this um incredibly intense but also very rewarding because you see it come out of the ground so quickly so you know Mm. you see a a site go from a bare patch of earth to a fully fledged garden in two or three weeks which which is really quite an amazing experience um Mm. Yeah, so I, you know, it's it's something that I I do really enjoy doing. I do always, you know, there's always a point where you think, why am I doing this? You know, why, what, what, what am I putting myself through this for? Um, but then when the garden's finished, uh, and you know, when it opens to the public, and you see the reaction of of people, and and you can show people into that space, and you know, talk about it, yeah. um, then that that makes it worth it. I think. Yeah, and really inspire people as well with your designs, you know. I know, like, the one at Hampton Court was absolutely fabulous. And you had the virtual reality um, studio there as well, which was really, really cool, wasn't it? And I guess that's linked to what you've done before, like, with your animation and drawing, that kind of thing. I guess it all kind of links in, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I I think that's it. With with show gardens, you can talk about um, the, the way that I... I kind of think it links most back into the animation training and animation work I used to do is this idea that that gardens and, and horticulture, you can tell a story. So it can become not necessarily fully conceptual, but you're you're kind of you're weaving a narrative into a garden in in much more of a considered way than you would do uh you know necessarily with someone's private residential garden no, they don't really care if there's a story behind it they just want to know where their outdoor kitchen's going you know what kind of plants you're going to put in and uh you know what kind of stone they're going to have but but with a show garden whenever you're working with a sponsor you really need to to tell that sponsor's story and you need to make sure that that comes across mm-hmm. clearly and, and evidently, um, you know, without the need for too much explanation or that kind of defeats the point. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So basically from show gardens to TV now, you've been working on uh, your garden made perfect, which uh, makes the most of technology as well. Was it like working on the show? Do you enjoy it? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, as I said earlier, it was, you know, the the kind of offer to do it came kind of out of the blue, really. Um, I I think it was probably even in lockdown. Um, I got a call from the producers and and it sounded, you know, on paper, it sounded like quite an unusual concept that two designers competing to win a pitch, pitching in virtual reality to, uh, you know, to a client. and I mean, I suppose the reality is that is the reality of it. It was quite a, you know, an, an interesting and also quite intense experience because the, you know, the, this is actually real. You are really pitching to a couple or, you know, two people um, a design and they have to make a, you know, fairly, not literally on the spot, but they have to decide fairly soon after they've just been pitched these two quite overwhelming uh, designs in virtual reality. So of, often these people have never put on a headset before they've never gone through a garden design process before and suddenly they're just bombarded with these two you know 3d designs they then have to make a, a fairly snap decision on and then build it almost immediately after that so it's um it's kind of you know again it's like garden design in in fast forward you're going through the a much higher pace a much faster pace because you've got to fit within the production um timelines but i i generally really enjoyed it you know it was it was really fun it was a bit often a bit like doing a show garden uh, as i said in that the, you know there's high pressure it has to be finished there's no slippage of time because you know it needs to fit and then needs to be edited and, and got out for uh for tv <laughs> mm-hmm. 
And then your book, obviously, uh, I love it. It's The Resilient Garden. It is absolutely full of take-homes as well. And really kind of educational in a, don't know how to describe it, but just in a really kind of chilled way. Like there can be a lot of things sometimes with the environment and we have to do this, have to do that. It's very dictatorial, but I feel like yours has got such a nice way about it. It's obviously, it looks good. It's designed beautifully, but it's got some really clear advice and nice take home. So tell us a little bit more about the book. How how long did that take to put together? Was it in your down season as well? <laughs> <laughs> it definitely wasn't in down season. It was no. in uh, kind of peak. I mean, there there isn't really a down season. I, the, the only down times are August and Christmas, really, in, mm-hmm. for me. August, everyone goes away on summer holidays. Christmas, yeah, everyone is... Uh, cr- Christmas is the only time where I'd say it completely shuts down. Yeah. Every other time, yeah, there's always something, you know, either you're designing or builds are happening or it's planting season or it's show season. Yeah. So really, the, the only real downtime, I'd say, in, in the industry is Christmas time. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the book I wrote pretty much evenings and weekends over six months. Um mm-hmm. So again, it was quite a rapid, uh, had to be done in quite a rapid time. I would have liked, you know, a couple of years to write it. Yeah. Um, but it, the, again, it just didn't work out with with the timeframes for um, for the for the publisher. You know, they wanted it, they wanted to release it. Uh, it came out this April, and I started writing it. I think um, the set sort of roughly October twenty twenty one. So yeah, the the actual process of writing took about six months, but then there was a lot of time editing and going over text and checking and you know sourcing imagery and working on the um, the virtual aspect. So we we also designed, uh, as you mentioned at Hampton Court, we had it on display, but a virtual garden that accompanies the book. So the the content in the book is uh, enriched and in, enhanced by supplying people with this qr code that takes you to a virtual experience so you can explore the garden in 3d and it shows the before and after so the before is uh you know kind of very typical uh a big expanse of lawn some fairly sort of drab evergreen shrubs a shed uh you know a dead tree um i see this this kind of space a lot when when you know when when you're called to go and have a look at people's gardens and a front garden it's entirely paved over, you know, no, no, no space for anything except cars, um, which again, you see a lot. So the book talks about how to uh, sort of rethink those types of space and, and do something that is um, more resilient to the effects of climate change, better for biodiversity, uh, you know, and also considers things like how to slow and, and harvest rainwater um providing edible food in a in a maybe slightly different way to typical raised beds or, or kind of allotment style beds um so that yeah as, as you say the idea was that the book had lots of take-home ideas but was delivered in a way that didn't feel too overly kind of preachy or patronizing um, yeah but i think when you are talking about these kinds of subjects you can often feel like you know if you, if you if people feel like you're shaming them or telling them they're doing you know what they're doing now is is wrong or uh mm-hmm. you know not acceptable then it, it often switches people off and they just don't want to have a discussion yeah very true yeah no it's a it's a lovely balance and it looks so sexy as well <laughs> i love the color <laughs> it's so cool. yeah it's a great book the resilient garden so uh listeners go and check it out for sure i have a, a question for you and that is with if all of your friends and family know that you're a garden designer and perhaps if you go to like an event or you know a night out and someone says oh this is tom he's a garden designer how do you feel about when they say oh what about this plant in my garden well my garden's like this how do i do this in my garden do you get all these questions (laughs) yeah i mean yeah often um it's quite funny actually the you know a lot of garden designers or landscape designer designers i know are very sensitive about what they're called say so often complain mm. that they get called the gardener or you know oh, uh, <laughs> whereas i don't mind you know I, I don't mind being referred i am a gardener so i, I you know i'm a gardener yeah. as well as a designer um but i think a lot of people don't really understand what a garden designer does or you know what a, a garden designer might do so people often think that i spend my whole time in the garden you know just putting plants in and, and you know, laying mm. paper, whereas I literally do none of that uh, for yeah. 
99% of my time. You know, show show gardens really are the only time where I'm actually physically doing physical work. Um, with all of our design work, we, we're a design-only practice. So we then work with contractors to implement the schemes. Um, and the, the main reason, I suppose, that I do that is because I just don't have the same skill level as the, the people that we work with. So I wouldn't want to be... I, I just couldn't implement or, or build the, you know, the the designs that we're designing. It's too complex. I don't have that that skill. So we, we work with other people that are really skilled. Um, and I don't have the time either. You know, the, we, we spend all the time designing. So often the, the kind of conversations at parties is like, oh, yeah, I've got, you know, what should I do with my, uh, what should I do with my lawn or um, mm. what? what plan would you recommend for this and it and then it kind of goes into this conversation around what i actually do and and i think yeah. the way i can explain it that people kind of get most easily is to say i'm basically like an architect but for outside spaces okay. yeah, yeah yeah that's a good description do, but you do know i can give you a discount in my uh online shop i've actually got a t-shirt that says please don't ask me to design your garden because when they hear, like, you know, probably you get the same, Ellen, we're at an event and they're kind of like, oh, will you come and design my garden? Or they'll be like, can you tell me why my plant died? And it's like, they're the only things you can possibly converse with someone to do with plants about. And it's like, you can talk to me about other stuff, you know. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> exactly people get their phone out and they say to me oh, i've got this plant yeah. in my garden can you tell me what it is or how yeah. do i do this what do i do with this i'm like i'm just here for the party exactly. <laughs> no, I, don't, I mean to be honest i i don't really mind those kind of discussion you know i quite like i i think one of my sort of goals is to get more people interested in gardening and that was another reason why i was kind of tempted to do the tv program why i've written the book you know why i do the show gardens it's to to broaden the knowledge and to get more people passionate about gardening and growing. So I, I actually don't mind, you know, if people aren't very experienced and want to know more, I, I quite enjoy those conversations. <laughs> cool. So tell us what other projects you've got in the pipeline. Will you be, uh, well, maybe you can't tell us, but uh, any flower shows doing gardens next year? Let us know um, when the news is released. I can't, I can't tell you, but I might be there. Uh, I say that. Okay, uh, cool. <laughs> The, the embargoes are, are not lifted until, uh, I think it's sort of November, sometimes even yeah. January. So I, I can't talk about that right now. Um, but I've got some interesting projects coming up. Um, working with a couple of brands uh, on some, I, I think as, as my sort of social media following has, has grown, I don't know if you guys have found this as well, but I get approached now more by brands and by um uh by kind of um yeah by by brands to to do sort of branded content type projects mm -hmm. this is you know ranging from kind of greening up projects to um sort of videos that demonstrate how to do things so i've got a few again i can't they're, they're all under nda and embargo but i've got a few things like that in the pipeline which is quite fun oh, nice. um working on um like a number of small pocket parks in and around london um so one we've just finished at leebridge library uh, a small community garden with studio weave um so that we did a community planting day there the other the other week and that's now open to the public mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think as i started out doing just private residential and my aim was always to get more public realm and, and you know spaces that people can actually go and see because i think it, it's often quite a strange experience designing a garden and then the only people that see it are the owners of that space you know, people see it on social media um potentially if you're allowed to you know if you're allowed to, to share it uh, and sometimes mm -hmm. clients don't want it shared because they're very private people uh, yeah i think what I'd like to, to to do more of is design public space that that anyone can visit and that is open and accessible. So yeah, alongside Lee Bridge Library, we're we're currently in the process of relocating the Chelsea Garden, uh, the RES Chelsea Garden, from this this May to IQL in Stratford. So that's in between the Olympic Park and the Westfield Shopping Centre. So that again will be open to the public, and that should be opening sort of late September, early October. Um, oh. And then, um, yeah, lots of still lots of private residential projects, um, and yeah, got some things internationally, which is is interesting, uh, an interesting yeah. challenge running a project from from this country and in, in another country. Yeah, uh, but yeah, lots going on. 
Wow, very busy. We love yeah, it. Yeah, you sound busy. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. We wanted to talk to you for such a long time, and it's been nice to find out more about what being a gun designer actually is, to find out more about your book, your TV work, and just generally all the things that you're up to. So thank you very much. Where can guys find out more about you? Where would you send them first? What's um, like- Probably Instagram, yeah. Tom Massey yeah. on Instagram is quite a good good place to do. I'm up website is tommassey.co.uk. Uh, again, that you know that's got a, a range of projects that, that we're working on. But yeah, I'd say Instagram is where where I'm most active, and and that's that's yeah. I use it kind of like a, a blog, really. Yeah, super. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you on very much. Today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. There we go. Ella's in charge of tech. <laughs> I'm, in char- I'm in charge of pressing record. That's as far as I <laughs> It always seems a mystery to me. Uh, anyway, hi. Yeah, we've got a special guest today, haven't we, Ellen, for our, our gossip, because we're rebranding our gossip as a haughty hangout. So if Gareth, our editor, is listening, we need a jingle for this. <laughs> <laughs> Haughty Hangout, we thought we'd shake it up for Series 13 and with our gossips, let's get someone else on who hangs out in the horticultural world to chat about gardening. And today we have, drum roll please, oh, oh Gareth, can you do a drum roll? <laughs> <laughs> the Groovy Gardener. Hey, how you doing, man? Hello. Great, thank you. Do you know, I've sort of uh, run around like a headless chicken to get here um, oh, because no. I was troughing, troughing treacle sponge and custard at the last moment and I'm going to live to regret that, aren't I, afterwards? But never mind, I've enjoyed that all the same and I've got here for you. Uh-huh. Still so, pudding. Mm-mm. Uh, exactly. So give us a a comfort head. food for those colder nights as they're drawing in. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> impossible to eat salad in November or December, isn't it? horrible <laughs> i'm still trying i'm hanging on <laughs> i know oh so uh introduce yourself to the listeners give us the top line because they might know you for victoria wood impressions or your lives or any one of those different things so let us know what you're all about <laughs> absolutely so i'm uh, chris jesson so otherwise known on instagram and other social media channels as groovy gardening uk um and um you'd have seen me maybe for the past three three years or so learning and developing my way in gardening it's gone from hobby to let's do a bit of volunteering to let's uh, be creative in the garden to i really want to take this forward as a career and then ultimately mm. i am now a, a gardener in two capacities you know i'm working in a couple of places as a gardener and the profile that you see online is what you get um totally true to myself and um i'm just loving the journey at the moment and mm. it's just um i just it seems to be developing as a person in all manner of ways that i never thought i'd have so thank you gardening for that and 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 in, oh, a, cool. in my own slightly eccentric eccentric style um that people seem to find enjoyable and you know that loyalty that comes along with it so yeah loving it and loving meeting new people a new arena of people like yourselves yeah yeah and everyone's got this common interest i think Sometimes, and um, Ellen, you probably can chip in on this as well. I think when you when you really get into having friends in horticulture, you find that you've actually finally got friends that you've got stuff in common with. Because <laughs> very often you've got friends that you have from like school or college, and the only thing you've really got in common is like circumstance or kind of being, you know, working together or kind of being at school together, which is not the same as having a common interest. I believe. I don't know. What, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I have to just say that I totally agree with everything you guys have both mm. said. Because I realised last year that I am the most boring person at a party. Because there is nothing... <laughs> I don't know anything else but plants. Like, I literally have no other topic of conversation you so do. Like, if we're not talking about plants i'm kind of like don't know what to say now so it is marvelous having friends in the plant world and just being able to sit here on my sofa this evening and chat with you about plants but it's annoying if it someone at a party wants on to that ask, interest, doesn't it? oh but if they want to ask why their plant died that's the worst thing 
<laughs> or can and you also come with green... my garden? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, with groovy gardening, uh, the reason, turning it on its head, the reason why mm. I set that up in January 2021 was because I was boring friends and family members with pictures of plants. Oh, so really? it became a place to store that imagery, stills predominantly mm -hmm. at the time, which then I realised, oh, I can do a bit of video with this mm -hmm. and narration. But that was the sole reason. There was no... Uh, career intent, no kind of media interest whatsoever. I didn't know how mm -hmm. to make any sort of garden video initially when I did it. Mm -hmm. But that was but the reason. Said, so we're in good company with one another tonight. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But you said 2021. I thought I thought you were pandemic. In the pandemic, Gardner. Or... Well, I suppose partway through, yes. Yeah, so I ah. certainly the account yeah, started yeah. afterwards. So I, I discovered lock, um, gardening beyond the general appreciation. I mean, I've always been old before my time. I'm 34 <laughs> going on 74 in many ways. And I've got no I love no that you're so honest about that. it. That's so cool. <laughs> I've always been, always been like that. So, you know, I would go to stately homes and I'd appreciate a garden in its most basic sense. Oh, that looks beautiful. Oh, that yeah. smells wonderful. That sort of sensory-led development of a garden hadn't the foggiest how to grow anything and didn't understand anything about succession planting or combination mm. planting colour, nothing about veg, just just no interest. Um, it was more, I mean, this is coming from somebody who, you know, liked classic cars. I mean, you like classic cars. Michael, I but, do. But, <laughs> Michael, but, the, the, but, but, you know, I'd sit there collecting brochures in my spare time. You know, I'm used to nerdy pursuits in in mm -hmm. just one way or another so i probably just reinvented it into the horticulture arena but but when lockdown happened that first major you must stay at home lockdown mm. we were all forced of course into the gardens and that forcing of being there placed us in a position where i started to i'm a very visual learner Mm -hmm. um, and I literally started to, we, we, we bought a new built house only four months prior. You could have thought it was a terrible time to get settled in your new home because you couldn't get settled properly. But actually, mm. more of the opposite, we were forced to settle in it and couldn't go anywhere else. So um, my brain started going forward with um, the sh looking at the shape of the garden and what we would like to have in it. No no sense of coherence to it it was literally mm -hmm. oh, we might dig a border there and plonk some plants in it in no matter what they were <laughs> didn't bother looking at their height and spread or compliance in this climate nothing well and, nor do i uh, but yeah. it'd be nice <laughs> you know to have a greenhouse but not from any kind of horticultural yeah. propagation reason it was a kind of if we don't get a greenhouse now we'll run out of room to have that and i just sold a car because I go through cars every five seconds and um, <laughs> thought, well, I'll spend some of that money on a greenhouse that I've got back um, <laughs> in replacement of where the bins should go. Yeah, you know, so it was just totally laissez faire, really. Um, mm. It wasn't until the second lockdown that we had, really, that the gardening mojo properly got into gear because. Mm -hmm. um, I, by that point, had started to struggle at work um, and I was off sick for six weeks, first time ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, with stress, really, I really found it hard to work from home. I was eventually working mm. from home for two years straight, no office. And I'd gone from depending on that social atmosphere quite a lot. I wouldn't say I'm a social butterfly, but I do re do respond well to that sort of work mm. environment. Of it's the change around. of scenery change of scenery oh, as yeah. well isn't it and Locked all of that yeah. yeah yeah and of course I, I made the decision when I came back to go part-time and by that point um I then had discovered the garden albeit in that plonker plant here type approach mm -hmm. but I discovered that I enjoyed doing that and felt a a resonance with it and that gave us some sort of vigor to what I did before so I'm by trade a chartered town planner until mm -hmm. recently that's what I've completely changed from so an office worker uh, you know pretty much very high in the game and I feel like at the moment I'm going back by the door with my lunchbox starting again all excited with my uniform uh -huh. and it's lovely to embrace that 
Wow, that's cool. What a lovely change of career. Yeah, really think, inspirational. Yeah. Uh, yeah, based upon what you said and, you know, other people who started gardening during that period, I think we should force more people to go into the garden, like literally force mm-hmm. them. You have to go outside. You have to spend time in the garden. Let's see how you turn out afterwards. <laughs> what, lock them out their houses? <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. And get a oh, greenhouse dear. if you can, just for the whim of it, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, that well, worked actually, out well. It could have been disastrous. That would be a great idea. So every single person in the whole world should be <laughs> allowed to have a free greenhouse. <laughs> or... Mm old frame or something for their balcony or patio or Mm. whatever and that i wonder if it would make people think "Hmm, i wonder if i could grow something in there (laughs) yeah sort of like a vessel to put to start going growing something in Uh, Um, yeah you'd be surprised how much of an impact that would have on people i mean i would say it probably it, it focuses the mind doesn't it um ultimately uh. and that's what i was doing i was sat out in the garden and we were it was a honeymoon period at the beginning of covid in the second mm. no, it was a very worrying time and thankfully we didn't feel very concerned of course a lot of people did feel very anxious mm. thankfully we didn't have that but we were sat out in the garden using the hammocks that we thought well kaiki when mm. are we ever going to use those hammocks anyway they became a real good use in that april weather and because the weather so, was perfect started reading yeah yeah started yeah. reading properly so reading books and observing what was going on in the garden yeah. and the way that the light traveled across it all those kind of sensory things which I'd never had the chance to do working full time Mm -hmm. and I used to use holiday um, and sort of time gallivanting around and I still do gallivant around. Mm -hmm. You gallivant a lot. To be honest, we're we're catching up with one another on on gallivant. No, I think you go more places than me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yes but this is tame compared to an earlier life where i'd literally <laughs> fill out every last available awake yeah. hour with oh, this idea cool, that I was resting through th- resting through traveling and resting through holiday um <laughs> and actually the sense of tapering some of that back so i did do some yeah. things and, and become more of a home body through through gardening mm-hmm. it's not necessarily city we're doing that Hmm. It's been very, very healing. And yeah, the gardening account was stemmed through that that boredom issue of 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 in others that I didn't want to repeatedly post pictures of that same rose that was unfurling and hmm. boring people to death. Or whatever it was, house house plant, um, and getting literally no, you know, tumbleweed coming in response. And um and and then having something and then it became something to just store imagery which then developed from mm-hmm. there and then you know the garden as it's evolved i realized what use particularly the instagram was as a platform to learn from others no matter how well known you are in gardening or whether you're you know mr and mrs joe blogs from sheffield who has got yeah, a lovely totally. garden you know <sighs> embracing mm-hmm. that very all-inclusive way of learning from others um mm. and then you know, I, I have i do enjoy talking to others i do enjoy being an advocate so i'm translating past work and past um past capabilities into this really and that goes on to what i'm doing now you know i'm not just going to be a gardener but i'm i'm, I'm going to yeah. be a gardener Supporting other people um, with um, partic- learning disabilities, particularly autism as well, which is just a really unique role to to embrace, really. Mm. I think that's really Amazing. beautiful. Um, what do you think of the Instagram gardening world? How is, like... Yeah, that was going to be my like, question. Good one, Ellen. We always, like, <laughs> we always chat, like, this little haughty hangout, like, 20 minutes or so is... We like to have a good old gossip. So what do you think of gardening Instagram? Ellen's drunk, by the way, oh, just so you know. Good, yes, good question. Good question. Because I go in peaks and troughs with it. And you would yeah. have seen potentially recently that I went and posted, hello, where are you? Is anybody there? 
And I go from that ah, to really yeah, yeah. resonating and riding the curve with it. Because I mentioned earlier about authenticity and a lot of the feedback that I get with Instagram. I love Instagram. It's still the primary uh, means at which I broadcast the Groovy Gardening channel. I have a mm -hmm. secondary one on Facebook that's much lesser followed, but still appreciated. Um, and I've got no plans really to sort of expand it so much because I don't want to dilute that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I've met so many people um, through Instagram. I've met yourself, Michael. I have met you before, Ellen, as, as we said before coming on um, after the Garden Press event, albeit you know in the distance. But we've resonated by with osmosis. And you've met her by here. osmosis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to. She is like that. an amoeba, so yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to remember hey. that as well through when, when I talk to others. On. Everyone hold on here. First of all, I am absolutely not drunk, Michael, because I heard you slip that one. I knew that one would get past. And secondly, I am not an Aniba either. <laughs> Let's see. I thought there was a delay to Norfolk because, you know, I'm in London, but you guys are right in the sticks, so there's a long delay with this Wi-Fi. <laughs> well, on. M1A1 corridor, I'll have you know. <laughs> the A1. Oh. I know, you're not keen on that road. <laughs> um, Sorry. So I know what you mean yeah, about the people seeing your posts and stuff, but like I think you're like me. I just I still do it anyway. And if people see it, they yeah, see I it. Do I, I try not I to do get it kind of I... Ugh, you know? No, no. And I do. Mm. So I whilst I do say these things from time to time, I do know and I'm mm. and I'm very much resolute to carrying on being myself as I am. Um, mm. But I do find I do struggle sometimes with this notion that you do have to repeat, and it seems to be more often like this: repeatedly post the same thing, or near enough the same yeah. thing, or perform, um, you know, to, to fill have the box. a yeah. the visibility, and and mm. and that's going to not be that's not going to be me. Partly because I've got. Yeah. Um, now the, the the horticulture interest has developed in many different ways it would be inappropriate on a work and personal basis to spread myself too thin in that way you know i mm. i've got the the job um for autism east midlands i work at eastern wall gardens of course we've got that layer we've got the green fingers work plant grow you know all mm. sorts of ambassadorial roles on there it's not going to be it's not going to fit for me to be just generating the same same thing and that's not what mm -hmm. i'm about and if i suddenly sort of default from um a generic portrayal of my garden to um me discovering a bargain in the garden center or me um meeting people on a on a on a trip and a tour around the garden that's going to be the way it is and i won't mm. stop from that I, the, the biggest benefit has been this community spirit in person and online and the fact that you have people from all over the world who are prepared to get up and in some cases that people have said they're prepared to get up in the morning at early mm. o'clock to watch what you're doing and they repeatedly mm. do that mm. and i always feel so humbled by that and you know you go to a show um or you go to a garden and it still feels very humble and strange sometimes when somebody goes, "Oh, can I have a photograph?" or "Can you um, um, come and can you tell me about this plant?" And they want your wisdom and nobody else's because they've spotted yeah. it. And it is cool. happening. And it, it's very odd. I mean, how do you two deal with that? Because that must happen even more. Just embrace I it. I think I always feel so yeah. excited. You know, like. It's just such a lovely community and someone wants to see you or chat with you and they appreciate what you do and you're able to help them. You know, if they've got questions for you, I, I, it makes mm -hmm. me kind of giddy. Do you know what I mean? With excitement. Yeah, it's it, well, it does. To be with like-minded like people. Yeah. Yeah, mm. lovely. I, I, think they're, I think they're wanting, they're expecting you to not welcome them with open arms in some respects, but I do. Um, despite being modest in thinking, well, you know, I'm just going to be myself here. But, but um, you know, I do embrace what they want to say and give time. You know, people sometimes, mm. are, sometimes they message, like a, when we met, actually, Michael, I was with um, a, a, another follower of mine at Harrogate. 
you mm. know, and, and I don't think they're expecting me to sort of give the afternoon to them that afternoon <laughs> because they, they think we're going to be here, there and everywhere. But that's not what I'm like, you know, we'll we'll allocate it um, because just simply I'm Chris, really. But it's it's <laughs> it's been great to generate a whole new um, arena of people, especially as a mm. career changer. It's great in a professional sense, but it means a lot more than that. You know, you know, nipping around to so-and-so's for a coffee, who I know is en route to so-and-so. There's been so many little yeah. uh, meetups, and you know, getting getting to know plant nurseries and meeting the people behind those and the love and care that goes into the growing of plants. I love doing that, and I love going to the shows. And if they're on location, you know, really taking a lot of time and effort to make sure I've met the gardeners behind oh. the gardens to show them out and give them the credit and things. He's I such love a brilliant that. ambassador for every level of what we're doing in horticulture. It's, br- it's brilliant. Yeah, Say, yeah advocacy yeah. meets gardening, which is no yeah. different. When you're a town planner, you've got to be a mediator of all different things. You've got to manage mm. the uh, local residents who might support or object it. You've got businesses. You've got mm-hmm. all the demographic issues around mm-hmm. inclusion and representing all parts of society yeah, wow. as best as you can. You've got mm-hmm. the law to battle against. You've got the applicant to keep happy, the council mm-hmm. to keep happy, all sorts of things. And you're the mediator in between. So you've got to be, A, know your audience. Mm. And... Um, I've learned that gardening is such a generous and I don't, I mean, I I know sometimes aspects of horticulture have been discussed as to whether it's elitist or not. I don't think at the ground level it necessarily is. Mm -hmm. I think that 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 is really quite generous and quite I think every industry has elitist sections of it anyway. I think this is natural. I should think so, yeah. Yeah. but, but it's, yeah, it feels a lot nicer. And it, as you mm-hmm. said, as you both hit the nail on the head, it allows us, us three, and, and mm. those who are listening, a lot of those who are listening, to be ourselves. Yeah. Um, without Which we couldn't do when we, were, when we were younger, like, for example. Like, uh, I don't know, were you into plants when you were younger? Because for me, for Ellen as well, like, we... Nobody realised that we could have a career in plants, and we certainly didn't tell our school friends that we love plants because no. we were geeks, nerds. But this wasn't a cool thing then. But now, and yeah. I think that's because we can all connect through online, social media, Instagram. Yeah. And yeah. It, and if I'd had Instagram when I was younger, I would have felt so much better about myself and the type of interests mm-hmm. I had, and more confident mm-hmm. about what career I would have. Because you know, I talked about this a bit recently, but. A lot of my career progression was really serendipitous, really. You know, there's a horticultural college near my hometown. There's also a company, Thompson Morgan, in my hometown. If I'd been in any other town, I don't think I would have found any opportunities because I wasn't confident to embrace horticulture. I didn't know what was possible. And certainly no career advice was pushing you in that direction. You know, only as a kind of booby prize, almost. You know, when yeah. they can't think what to do with someone, they tell you to go to Horticulture College. And that's, yeah, they did. Yeah. That's exactly what they used to do. And I don't really know how that, if that is the same thing now or not. I yeah, really I don't know. It isn't, but it was if mm. you got low grades, then one of the recommendations was to go to the local Horticultural College, which was at a... Uh, agricultural college in Norwich, um, Eastern mm-hmm. College, which is like Eastern and Otley, um, which now I don't think are Eastern and Otley. But anyway, uh, that's uh, that was the place where people went if they didn't get mm. good grades along with hospitality. And mm. both industries are extraordinary industries. So I think that's yeah, yeah. very unfair to, to do that and to think that. So, yeah, I had no idea. I remember saying to my careers teacher for the first time I told someone at school that I like plants and she mm. told me I could be a teacher or a nurse. That was her mm. reply. And I literally yeah. just said I like plants and she was like, you could be a teacher or a nurse. I was like, mm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I weird. Mean, I would love to see, uh, and there are a lot of people still flying the flag for getting it more entrenched in the curriculum and I'm happy to be one of those if somebody were to ask me to, to do that championing it, it it isn't really on the curriculum i don't think it's pigeonholed quite in the same way because of uh, equality legislation is much more reinforced now there is the concept of discrimination indirectly which is better taught now which you know we are verging on aspects of that mm-hmm. in life if we try and 
you know, go down the age old line. It's like, you know, pigeon holding women to become secretaries because they're, you know, perceived to not be mm. able to anything other than that if they're, you know, if they're um, working out of the home. I mean, you know, we've gone, thankfully, gone beyond those years in the main of that, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, it's no different to that. I didn't develop a knowledge or or repertoire of of plants from an early age but i did develop a repertoire of planning from a relatively early age that's Mm -hmm. what i went down with with my interest there but the the plants can i just ask what what is really planning is it like is it also like drawing a map of the town and stuff like this well it started off like that yeah well it's it starts start in my case it started off like that so i was very I was a problem child when I so so a lot of people get put into horticulture in that in the mm. days gone by because also because they were perceived to be a problem child and I'm not in any way cast, casting any suspicions mm. about you two being that. Um, <laughs> but what I mean is again, it's that stereotype. I wanted to be of, there. I wanted um, to be know. in horticulture anyway. So it wasn't a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but it's it, you know I was um i mean i was diagnosed with autism 25 years ago and mm-hmm. you know i couldn't hold if i was doing this podcast now i wouldn't in that situation i wouldn't be able to hold a conversation i had to have speech therapy i would be very uh irritable anxious angry um thankfully not abusive to anybody but i would be physically aggressive with objects like throwing chairs up at things Mm. when i misunderstood people and i would be vulnerable and gullible you know i got into trouble in various situations at school through no fault of my own such as being you know told to go in the staff room by pupils and then doing it i got bullied a lot you know i got spat on i got thrown off school buses Mm. i got pushed to the floor and kicked and all sorts so you know a very 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 intelligent person so very good at the uh, learning but was missed out a lot Mm -hmm. of learning opportunities and excluded from school never excluded Mm -hmm. from school but missed out of school opportunities Mm. but what i did use to like was solitary work i used to prefer being on my own um not now i'm better (laughs) with others and i would uh, draw maps so i would be often drawing these huge great big a1 a2 pages with my own maps i'd memorize Mm. from the aa road atlas or i used to draw maps when i was young as well (laughs) <laughs> I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Well, I've got examples here at home. And I'd be going on drives out with my grandparents or parents or whatever, and I'd be looking out the window and memorising all of what I saw, and then that would translate. So wow. you, there was an identification with gardens in that sense because I would draw the garden out as part of the mm-hmm. city plan that I was doing, mm-hmm. which normally had about 3,000 ch- uh, churches, a Woolworths, a air- massive airport that was totally incongruous to the uh, size <laughs> The place you know and a few little chef restaurants and other brands of day gone by and 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 but there was so much detail in there and i i mean i loved it and i became very much known for that i didn't realize at that stage though where horticulture fits in the wider sense but my grandfather on my dad's side was a very passionate gardener he went to the national agricultural college that's where he met his uh, next my grandmother and that's now rest park at bedfordshire which is english heritage own that so um and he had a fantastic garden and i'd help lay concrete paths and rockeries and all sort all of those sorts of in vogue fashionable 1990s mm-hmm. things i'm a just an 80s baby born in 89 <laughs> thank goodness and um I just, I didn't realise until this era now that we're talking in just how profound that must have been because I think a lot mm. of those things must have been engraved in, in the brain. Um, I Very similar to my great, to my grandfather, I know him a lot, I was very close to him. So it's it's really nice that I can now think that I must uphold some of his values in what I'm doing. Mm. My mum's very good at gardening, but we've visited gardens a lot. I've got my mum to credit a lot through for my own personal progress, but we we didn't do a lot of gardening. I mean, I'd cut the hedge and, and I used to love the reward of getting the bindweed rhizomes out of the front hedge, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. Uh, so it's all late blo- late blooming, which is a tale cool, of me. You know, cool. I didn't blossom properly till university, mm-hmm. um, where unsurprisingly I did planning. And I've always set out connections website said, 
you know, those sort of random job questionnaires that you go through or you did as a school person, school, school child. And it came up after the questionnaire that I'd either be a town planner or a tram driver. So, you know, that <laughs> former is what I went with because it confirmed my... Um, thoughts really, but, but yeah, how I've spent... that come, it's come back around, you know. So, you <laughs> had those things planted, pardon the pun, in your mind from when you were young, mm. and you have those lovely memories of being with your um great grandfather and all of that going on. Mm -hmm. And then you went and done something that you were super good at with the planning, and like you've enjoyed it, but it's just come back around, and now you're kind of out there getting your hands dirty, enjoying the world <laughs> of plants again. And, super nice. like, and the skills that you will have learned. Um, I actually find that horticulture especially is an amazing industry to be able to bring skills into from prior um, work. Cause yeah, really, so much crossover. As a, yeah, as a horticulturalist, you are you need to know English, maybe Latin if you fancy it, but maths, you know, physics, biology, geography, um, history, I don't know, like all, all science, art, all of it, you know. So whatever <laughs> career, you know, if you're listening to this and you really want to get into gardening, at home and you think well I'm working at the moment in an office you have a ton of skills that you will have learned in that office that you can transfer mm. to horticulture for sure totally. absolutely you know I say to people now um I and I truly believe this even having just been a garner thrush I only started at Easter in February I absolutely love it there I only started at Autism East Midlands last month I love it there and I can already identify that I don't in any way feel any inferiority com of intelligence compared to this mm -hmm. you know stem subject high flying consultancy office job which I love doing for the best part mm -hmm. Obviously, I've evolved from it, but I, if anything, I feel like I'm using my brain more mm. doing this because I'm. It's about enrichment, mm. and you know, I'm in. I'm keen to embrace um, aspects of horticulture that perhaps you know, even if it's plants that I don't particularly like, it doesn't prevent me from a growing them or b educating or being educated yeah, no, about course. them because Too many it's plants developing plants. your 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 yourself and knowledge yeah. of that and yeah. that's what carries you and 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 i just yeah i thought i mean if i did discover this early of course i think i probably would have done but it's so nice to have that privilege and it is a privilege of being able to discover something else um, mm -hmm. but i personally um I'm very much a firm believer that if you do find something to go and get it, um, no matter how long it takes, be determined, be yourself and sort of you know, not, not get pegged peg down by anybody in those ambitions <laughs> and um, you know, try and work your way to it in some way, shape or form. And that's cool. what I've done. Well, that's nice. You know, and that's what I, I say to anybody listening. Yeah, that, that's yeah, awesome. I think that's an amazing end to our haughty hangout as well. That's, you know, great. Yeah, well. that's just been really cool. Yeah. It's a new thing for I us to invite guests. In. It's a new for us to invite guests into the gossip. So you're, you're actually one of the first. So it's pretty cool. Smash it. Yeah, well, it's been really lovely talking with you both this evening. I like this. Oh, I like, you know, it's nice to have, let you say, asking me about Instagram, this wider sphere of actually understanding about um, you know, listening to podcasts and putting them on in the mm. car or on, on, on stream. That's another facet of my life that I wouldn't have done. So it's already yeah, enriching course. that. You know, and I'll often listen to these sorts of things quite a lot, or I'll re-listen to them as well afterwards, but I'll often listen to them retrospectively as well. Um, oh. Well, you, you can know, listen to this in about time. 10 days. Yeah, so, you can listen to this really <laughs> soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, we better go, because um, I've got a meeting with someone in America, and Ellen's going out-out, apparently. I'm not going out. I just out. made that up. <laughs> you just well, my mum's in Norwich, know. Ellen. Chris, I don't oh. know if you noticed, but Michael just makes up things about me throughout every single episode. I don't even know oh, what I I I people power. believe about Ellen Mary. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to record our next plant-based podcast. Oh, oh, of course. Episode. Sorry. Is <laughs> so that that's where I'm really going. Sorry, Still sorry. sitting on this sofa, but in another Zoom room. Oh, <laughs> so. Another world. Cool. 
Anyway. Awesome. But no, it's really, really cool to have you here, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Likewise, thanks for having me on. All right. <laughs> see you both soon. You so much. See you soon, see dude. You hey. soon. No worries. Cheerio. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>